Hi there, and welcome back to the Energy Sector Heroes podcast. My name is Michelle Fraser, and every week I will speak with incredible people who share their lessons, experiences, and stories from their time spent in the energy sector. Hi there, and welcome back again to this week's episode. If you're new to the show, then please take a second to subscribe and even consider sharing the show with just one other person. This week, I am joined by Christina Dasalia. Christina is an energy uh, sector advisor. Christina, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Hi, everyone. I'm Katrina Dasalia, and I'm an energy sector advisor from Kungana Advisory. So we're an energy consulting advisory based here in London, and we work with lower and middle income countries to transition to net zero. Okay. Net zero, zero is a quite a hot topic. How are the other, do you, as an energy advisor, do you help other countries to transition as well to net, net zero? Yes. So, so we do a lot of things. So what we do in the company is actually quite broad. So we do some technical modeling of the power systems in different countries. So specifically, Sub-Saharan Africa is one of the countries that we're mostly doing technical works with. But we also do financial work. So looking at kind of like transaction advisory, doing due diligence report for um, clients as well. But we also help policy and regulators in order to kind of like look into procurement mechanisms for renewable energy or look into their power purchase agreements so that there's more renewable energy that can be deployed in these countries. Okay, so how are the other countries getting on with uh, dealing with net zero? Are they quite far advanced? Since we worked with a lot of like lower to middle income countries, so specifically Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia, I wouldn't say it's very advanced compared to how we have it here in the UK. But I guess the context would be very different, right? Because these countries are struggling or kind of like there's less capital that could be deployed in order to reach their targets. So I think, you know, there's a lot of countries even... um, um, donor-funded institutes or um, different organizations helping them. So that's actually really nice to see that, you know, most of the people around the world are collaborating in order to reach this specific targets that everybody has, essentially. Okay, so what do you find that the biggest challenge for other countries meeting net zero? It's very different. So, for example, I think the struggle is, the prices of electricity, right? So for example, most of the countries find that coal would be the cheapest option for them to power their countries. And some of the countries doesn't even have, you know, 100% electrification. So because that's a priority, but also moving forward, kind of like uh, moving or transitioning away from coal while keeping the prices low and electrifying all citizens in their country is important. I guess the balance. So I think there's that energy trilemma that everybody is trying to solve that, you know, you need to balance prices for these countries, especially the people who wouldn't be electrified or people who wouldn't be served by the grid are people who are in the marginalized communities or people who couldn't afford electricity. So I guess the change or transition to net zero for them or these countries would mean different compared to developed countries because developing countries would need to ensure that the prices are low for these countries. But renewable energy for these countries is quite new. So the cost of capital could be quite high for them to kind of like fully deploy it. Okay. You were also saying before that a lot of the countries were collaborating. Um, Yes. So, for example, we did this piece of work um, in Southeast Asia. So there's a organization who basically kind of like oversees or we basically have this um, organization that we work for, wherein they're looking at Indonesia, Vietnam, the Philippines, and looking at kind of like best practices, practices in each of those countries to kind of like leapfrog or kind of like emulate those good practices in order 
for them to apply it in their country. So I guess banks, international banks are all helping foreign countries are deploying, you know, capital or money for these developing countries as well. So I just think it's a nice way to, you know, bring expertise in developed countries. For example, the UK are, you know, the pioneers in offshore wind and them putting or going to Southeast Asia is quite nice to see because, you know, these developed countries, they would know what to do, but also getting that experience from other countries and what they did in order to, you know, fast track net zero. It's something that people would need to do. They need to do knowledge sharing in order to be as quick as possible to transition. Okay. But that's quite surprising because you wouldn't think this, maybe some of the other other some of other com- countries are are maybe not so advanced in technology in, in technology and knowledge to take their country into reaching net zero. I didn't think yeah. that would be a problem. Yeah, yeah, I think it is one of the challenges in these countries. So what I'm seeing is that you know experts from different parts of the world are going into this country and kind of like helping them what they actually need to do in order to tackle that so that the local people in there gain knowledge or kind of like understand what best practices are available for them to kind of like look at in order to see what fits them and do what would work best in those countries. So I think experts just helping these develop developing countries is essential in order to transition as quick as we need to. Okay. Sounds amazing, actually. So how did you get a job being a, an energy advisor? Yeah. So initially, before moving to London, I was based in Manila. So I grew up in there. I was working for the Department of Energy, um, working on a similar role in renewable energy, doing research as a consultant. And then I moved here to do my postgrad degree. And it's on environment and energy technology and economics. And then I just found this job on LinkedIn. And I just thought that because they're doing a lot of works in developing countries I just thought that it was really interesting that they do that so yeah that's how I got the job wow that is quite amazing actually okay so did you have to go through quite a number of uh, interview stages then yes yes I did it was interesting I, I couldn't remember how many stages the interview was for when I applied for this role but we basically did case studies just having the knowledge of, you know, the energy sector. I think the case study that I had was related to building a hydro project in a developing country and kind of like, what do you need to consider? And kind of like government relations as well and the technical aspects to it. So it was quite fun. Yeah, it was good fun, actually. Okay. Because some people, I mean, I do have seen on LinkedIn in the past that some people still think that maybe over maybe one or two interviews is still quite uh, quite a lot. Do you think that it is or do you think it's quite normal? Um, I actually think I did more than that. I think for most of the roles that I applied for when I moved to the UK, it's kind of like minimum three, I think. But it, it does seem quite a lot, to be honest, but I actually did enjoy it. And I think more than anything, it kind of like, because there's a lot of applicants, it's really competitive in here, like looking for a job, especially a job based in London. I just see my friends just going through a lot of interviews and going through a lot of stages. But I guess that's a way for the employers to kind of like see the best fit candidate. But it's also a good learning experience for the applicant as well. So it goes both ways. Okay, I think so too, actually. I think there would be quite quite uh it would be quite competitive to get for jobs in london actually Mm -hmm. i I think so too so did you have any role models during your career so my parents would be my role models um so they both work in the energy sector as well it was quite 
Um, so I did electrical engineering for my bachelor's and at times it was a bit weird, especially because I did it in the Philippines. There weren't a lot of girls who was doing it, but because I had my mom who was an electrical engineer as well, it didn't feel too bad. I guess having a role model that, you know, is female, is in the industry was quite nice to, you know, not feel left out sometimes because it tends to be a bit male dominated. But at the same time, the boss that I have in Manila when I was working in there, she's the head of renewable energy before and she's a female as well. So I guess it's really nice to know a lot of people in the industry. I don't know if there's anybody specific that I would say, but yeah, a lot of people who I kind of like encountered during my early days in the industry were definitely helpful. Okay. Sounds amazing. So what do you find is the most challenging thing about your current role? I guess it's it's one of the reasons why I love working for the company I am working right now. But one of the challenges is because we do a lot of works in developing countries, sometimes finding the right balance or kind of like going in there and seeing how it actually is. It's quite sad to see, you know, the the situation in these countries. For example, we do a lot of work in South Africa as well. And I couldn't imagine how many, you know, load shedding they experience because they don't have like a stable source of electricity. Whereas, for example, here in the UK, we're so used to, you know, having electricity 24-7. And I just think that working in this role, sometimes you would get those hints of, you know, sadness just because you want to do more or help more beyond on beyond on the work that you're doing, if that makes sense. But I think that's why a lot of people are working in the industry as well, so that there could be a change and at the same time, you know, solve the issue of, you know, transitioning and kind of like reducing the emissions from, you know, carbon dioxide emissions. And that sounds amazing as well. So what do you enjoy the most about your current role? Definitely the people I work with, they're really all good and smart people. They're really passionate about, you know, doing these types of work that we do. So it's really nice to see people just being passionate about what they do. So I really enjoy, I really do enjoy that one about my work, just seeing people collaborating and being like really finding ways in order to solve issues that is presented. I think that's a really nice environment to be in. Okay, yeah, I think so too. Do you think teamwork is actually quite an important aspect of uh, of working your the way that we work? Yeah, for sure. Um, we do a lot of works with associates across the world as well, and we do collaborative work with the people based here in London. And I think it's really good to have that teamwork because it's essential to kind of like listen to whatever like everyone's suggestion, because in that way, in that process of like listening to other people, you get the best thinking, Um, you get the best thinking or you get the best solution for whatever you're doing. So it's nice to listen, work as a team, because during those conversations that you might have during meeting, that's where you get the best answers for whatever project you're working on. Yeah, I think so too, actually. I do. Do you think that communication is quite important in a team as well? And how do you effectively communicate with your team? Oh, it's definitely important. I think sharing and communicating is kind of like an essential thing about being a consultant with your teammates and especially for the people that you work with. So for example, if you have consultancy work for a government or the regulator of the energy sector in a country, it's always important to listen to them, but also communicate on what you think would be the way, like the best way forward for them to do things. So yeah, a diplomatic conver- uh, like communication is always important. Yeah, I, I think so too. But do you find it difficult or maybe I should have word, do you find it intimidating dealing with them 
uh, maybe government officials of from different countries. I mean, because you're quite early on in your career as well. Yes, I actually really do. Sometimes I go in there and I feel like I'm the youngest person in there. Sometimes they would say they have like 26 years of experience and I would be at the back of my mind that's practically my age. So it gets intimidating, but I guess it's also nice to work with people who does listen to younger people and mentions that they like working with younger people because they give a different aspect to it. They give a different or a fresh idea to the subject that we're working on. So it really does get intimidating, especially when you're presenting to people who are more senior to you. But I guess that's one thing that I am learning to overcome. But I am early in my career still. I mean, how do how do you navigate working with um, with the people who have, who are maybe quite senior and maybe have maybe twenty six years, thirty years uh, experience? How to get your point across? I think um, initially the most important thing is to listen to them first because yeah. So essentially, um, after listening to them, then you could come up with your own suggestion because you have listened to them already and a lot of people would be open to like listening to your suggestions anyways but I guess when you're the youngest person in the youngest person in the room it's always important to listen to them and then kind of like say what's in your mind as well I actually think they do appreciate um people everyone to collaborate and just just say whatever they think needs to be done okay I think so too but then maybe some young people might not might not have the confidence to do that because even though you're working with people that maybe do have a lot more experience than you then but they would still value your opinion to because you would be coming into the industry with a fresh eyes and new perspective so how would you have any advice to give to our younger audience on how to overcome maybe talking talking up and, and putting your point across? I guess it's going to be... So sometimes I would have those moments as well. Sometimes you're doing something and you feel like you have your imposter syndrome just because you feel like you're not well-equipped for the role that you're doing. But something that I do remind myself all the time and what my boss tells me as well is that you need to take ownership for your work. So because you have done a lot of research, a lot of like work prior to meeting the people or you have done basically a lot of work in the industry already, you just need to embrace that you know a lot of things. But at the same time, you do learn a lot from people as well. So I guess when you kind of like own up to your work and essentially when you forget that you're a young person and just give them your opinion, I think that's how things would be better because I think it's confidence that would basically, basically if you have confidence, the people you're talking to would basically see that you know what you're doing and what you're saying. But also, of course, you need to study and, you know, do a lot of research or kind of like well prepare yourself for the interviews or the meetings that you would get into so that when you face them, you wouldn't feel like you don't know anything. Okay. Okay. That is really good advice, actually. So, I was going to ask you, um, have you ever had any career disasters? I know that you're still quite young in your career. Because we do a broad range of things in our company. So we do technical um, policy, but also financial work. So because my background is a bit more technical, I didn't know anything about like finance or, you know, income statements and all that. The first kind of like project that was assigned to me when I started part-time for the company was it had something to do with financial modeling. I did not know about anything, but I felt like it was a disaster because it was a transaction. Sorry. I felt like it was a disaster because it was a transaction advisory. 
So it was very fast paced. But because I didn't know anything, it, it, it was chaotic. It was, it, it, I felt really bad because I felt like I wasn't bringing anything into the table. So yeah, that was really quite stressful. But I guess I did learn a lot from it. I also just try to push myself, ask a lot of questions and tr just try to see where I could help. And that's amazing because I don't think any, everybody, everybody doesn't know everything. So I think that you would come across these challenges early on in your career as well. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's something that I realize as well. It's very different. Like everything that you learn in school and university is very different to what you would do and work anyways. I was lucky because whatever I did for my bachelor's and my master's, it's very well related to the energy sector. So I didn't really have a hard time kind of like knowing some of the things. But even then, you would still work on a project that would be very different or something that you wouldn't really know. But I guess being open to learning asking people and just really like immersing yourself in the project would just allow you to learn more than what you know, which is actually quite good because it's a continuous learning process, right? And that's the fun thing about jobs. Yeah, because I always think that uh, after you le leave uni universities when the real learning begins. Exactly, you, exactly. If you know what I mean. So what do you enjoy most about your job? I really do enjoy, um, sorry, what do I enjoy about my job? There's a lot of things I actually enjoy about my job. I think working with developing countries is something that I really wanted to do, especially because I came from a developing country, the Philippines. So it's really nice to kind of like give back, help them, because essentially this you know climate action so a lot of the climate action it's always like very hard for developing countries so i really do enjoy that i'm giving the opportunity to work in these countries as well another thing that i enjoy about my work is just being able to kind of like be with like-minded people learning from a lot of people i've been to different um conferences as an attendee, or I also was able to present in a conference as well. But it's always interesting to see how different people are just really going out and being passionate about, you know, having a change in the sector, which is really quite nice to see, especially as a young person. That is impressive, actually, that you have presented at a conference. Didn't you find that nerve-wracking? It was, it really was. But I mean, I wasn't the only one who presented as well. So I was with my boss. So we presented our study to the countries that we were working for just a few months ago, actually. So yeah, I guess there were a lot of preparations in order to get to that event as well. I did a lot of analytical and research things in order to kind of like know what I'm presenting. So it's always quite nice to do that because you get to present what you have done in front of the representatives of those countries. So that was quite nice. I think that would be quite stressful, actually. Was it quite a, <laughs> did you have quite a big audience? I think it wasn't, it wasn't like a big conference. It was like, I think the most number of people is around 50. So it wasn't like a massive conference, but it's a decent amount of people, especially because most of them would be representatives of different energy sector agencies in the specific country. So they're a bit obviously senior to me, but yeah. It's still quite impressive. 50, pe 50 people, it's still quite quite a large uh, conference, I would have thought. It is. It is. It is. So you must be you must be very proud of your achievements yeah but honestly every time we do those seminars in front of an audience I always think about it as me not exactly presenting I mean in a sense right I am presenting kind of like the study or the things that we have discovered or kind of like 
seen in these countries and, you know, things that could be improved in order for them in order for them to deploy more capital investing in renewable energy. But I think more than that, it's not me presenting what I know, but getting them to talk as well, seeing if we agree on things. So it's basically me just facilitating a conversation. So I think in a way that makes it less nerve wracking. Get what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. I think it's still amazing. I do think it's amazing. <laughs> Thank you. So do you have any advice for any of the younger generation that c- coming into the energy sector? I think my advice would be go do something you're passionate about, right? So energy sector is very broad. There's a lot of people working in the industry, but there would be specific things that you would like or you would dislike. There would be things that you would be passionate about. So I guess choosing the right thing for you is going to help you a lot because when you're passionate about something, you're going to be more confident to do things. You're ready to learn more things if you're in a space that you want. And it's not going to be easy because, you know, the first thing that you go into, it wouldn't be like the final thing that you would want to do for the rest of your life. But I guess learning, trying a lot of things and just, you know, gauging your your feel for that industry or specific sector in the um, industry is going to help you a lot. But yeah, work in something you're passionate about. I agree. I agree. If, if you've got the passion for what you're working in, I think you never work a day in your life. Exactly. It, less, it makes things a little bit less stressful, right? I mean, I think all jobs would be stressful, whatever industry, especially when you're trying to tackle climate I think that's really stressful but I guess when you have that passion it makes it a little less stressful it makes it worth it almost I think so too actually I think so I'm going to ask you maybe one final question I don't normally ask this quite a lot to other to other guests so if you could go back in time what piece of what piece of advice would you give yourself Maybe. I think to be a bit more confident and less less over sorry I do that again yes <laughs> <laughs> I think I would tell myself to be more confident and to worry less I guess sometimes you overthink things or kind of like question why you get opportunities but I think if you just embrace it then it gets better Because I think a lot of the times before, whenever I get an opportunity, I would always be like, oh, it's probably not for me. But because you don't try, then it's always something that you would be like, oh, was it for me kind of thing? And I guess that is applicable in all aspects of life. But I think that's mostly applicable for me in work opportunities or even things that I did for university, I guess when I was just a go-getter and I did a lot of things without worrying too much, I would have been better at what I'm doing. But I guess there's still time to kind of like be a go-getter right now or do a lot more things and just basically be confident about what I'm doing. Yeah, that's amazing advice as well. That's all the questions I have today. I would like to thank Katrina for your time. That brings us to the end of another episode. Thanks for listening and see you next week. Thanks, Michelle. That brings us to the end of another episode. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the show, I'd like to gently encourage you to leave a five-star rating wherever you listen to podcasts and share the show with another person. You can also follow me on LinkedIn or via my website, www.michellefraserconsultancy.com. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.